Hey guys, so I'm in Nur Sultan, Kazakhstan. Uh, until recently, it was known as Astana. And you can see that, you know, it is somewhat different. But to be honest with you, it reminds me of London. And that's not just because I saw a statue of the Beatles back there. Um, you can see that, that the design is very much British. Um, you can, you've got a coffee store behind me called Coffee Boom in English. One thing I like is the idea of having these street signs in English as well as um, in the local language. And this is a very diverse country. Uh, it's almost impossible to tell uh, you know, who's, who would be from Kazakhstan. It's a very unique mix of Russian and Asian. And in fact, the people here, uh, for the most part, do speak fluently both languages, Russian and Kazakh. But what bothers me, I mean, this is completely British, right down to the CCTVs, um, which are right behind me. And if you think I'm joking, I mean, this is exactly what you would see if you went to London. And it dawned on me that, there you go, right there. And it dawned on me, you know, who are the real estate magnates putting their money in London real estate? It's the Russians. Apparently, the allegation is that this is, you know, dark money. This is, you know, mafia money going in. I don't know that. But coming here, it dawns on me that there's been this sort of, you know, economy of real estate tycoons all over the world that are making the world look the same. And that's something where, you know, even the president of the United States is now a real estate magnate. That's, so this, isn't some, this is not something that's restricted to London, Russia, or Europe. It's something that's taking place all over the world. It's in some sense that's because people do tend to want to be to want to see things that are different from where they live. That's the impetus, in fact, behind travel, is that you want to get out there and see something different. What I'm trying to say is, you know, this is this is my 51st country, and what I'm trying to say is that if you go to the places that Google Maps tells you about that has the most reviews the most good reviews, they all look the same. I just went to a couple of coffee shops and nothing in there was Kazakh. They had everything there was from Europe. So all over the world, you're seeing this really, really interesting sort of shift in power from, you know, governments that have essentially outsourced city planning to real estate tycoons who have over time built up their own connections to secure cement and then to make it into concrete, to get the bricks, to get the raw materials, and of course the expertise necessary to create these homogenous villages. And what I'm trying to say is it's not, it's not an accident. Though we have essentially now, you know, on top of that structure, we also have a private security team. So, you know, private security is one of the fastest growing businesses in the whole world. Um, and you can s sort of envision this new world where everything looks the same. And in fact, um, you have private sort of security and, and the new segregation will be private neighborhoods for, uh, where if you're lucky to get in, you're doing very well. Uh, but if you're not lucky to get in, to get past that security guard, um, you know, you, good luck. You can already see that in some, in some sense in some neighborhoods in the West, in the sense of private schools versus public schools, depending on where you live. When, if you go to the Philippines, you'll see again exactly what I talked about. I mean, even if you get an, uh, a Grab or an Uber, you can only get Grab now uh, in some places. Um, you'll see that sometimes to get to where you want to be, you know, you're going to have to pass a private security gate. They want your, they want sometimes, you know, they've got a whole list of IDs that they believe are legitimate. If you don't have one of those IDs, you can't get through. And I've had some some instances where my driver didn't have, you know, either the national ID or something else from another list. You can see over and over again this conflict between private versus public. There's a Burger King back there, British, owned now. Um, you can see that over and over again this conflict now between private entities having the heft and the money and the clout to create their own standards about what is required. 
And that can then be used to create codes of conduct, behavior, and so on. It is not a coincidence that the world is starting to look the same. It's because that's where the money is. People have always told me growing up, buy property, buy property, you can't lose. When 2008, 2009 came around, I said, actually, you can lose, here you go. I didn't feel too good about it because at that time, you know, if you owned any, anything, it went down in value, whether it was stocks, even bonds. Why? Again, it seems like in a quest for development, all roads lead to property, real estate, and the people who control the development uh, around that enterprise. What's this going to look like for people or in governments in the future? And I don't know. But I can't imagine that we want a world where, you know, wherever we travel, uh, it just starts to look the same. The same lights, on, you know, light shows on buildings and so on. At that point, I don't know what, what, hap what, <clears throat> what happens because it used to be, if you listen to people that lived in, you know, these, these formerly closed off societies, it used to be that they would tell you that the government would tell them there's no need to go outside this country. Everything you want is right here. Well, you can imagine a scenario where you can travel anywhere, but you don't want to because it's all going to be essentially the same except for language. In other words, there's going to be a McDonald's, a Burger King, and possibly, you know, there's going to be one of these little neighborhoods that's an international village that'll give you, you know, whatever you want in terms of cuisine from Europe and, you know, Russia and so on. What I like about Kazakhstan is that it's got a nice mix of Europe and, and Russia. I mean, if you ever want Russia to join the EU, um, this would be the model. Now, Kazakhstan, of course, is very unique. It's got oil. It's one of the largest countries in the world. It's also one of the youngest. You look around, you've got a lot of young people, a lot of energy. So, you know, because of its massive wealth, um, everything here is developed. I mean, the roads made of asphalt, which is... A, which is a byproduct of oil, um, you know, is they're better than anywhere else I've, I've seen. Of course, I'm in the in, in the capital city, which moved from Almaty to here. I go to Almaty in a couple of weeks, so I'm very interested in seeing what Almaty looks like. Um, but it may it may be that the, all the capitals in the world will look the same because the politicians have aligned themselves with real estate magnates. And that means that eventually to see something different, you're going to have to go to a city that's not part of the capital, uh, like a second city or a third city, to get an understanding of what people there are, are like in terms of culture. What's great about this country is because of its connections to Europe and Russia um, and, and the UK, um, you know, you've got everything here. You know, you go to, you, if you go to some countries, you only have, you, know, you don't see necessarily American cars or Japanese cars. Here you've got everything, um, although I haven't seen Lada, uh, which is a bit weird, but uh, you do have pretty much every car model, just looking at it, Toyotas, um, I mean, you've got everything, uh, that's a Honda, um, you know, what's, what's really lovely about this place is the architecture is beautiful. So, it's a very interesting place to be. Um, you know, I think that people should visit simply because um, it's a lovely place to just sort of explore. You would need a car, um, although, you, of course, you've got your different apps, Yandex, Taxi, um, you know, Maxim, uh, M-A-X-I-M, um, and then what else? Uh, you've got Bolt as well. All of them work fairly well. Uh, Yandex seems to be the one that, you know, worked the best for me, uh, although it didn't verify my Amex card which may be another sign that the, United, that the United States is sort of falling behind in terms of setting its own standards uh, for secure financial transactions. The rest of the world may not just want to follow. And when that happens, you've got some issues because if you have multiple standards uh, and one country decides that it wants to set its own standards, it may have the best standard, but if no one else wants to follow along, it's going to be left behind. That's why this idea of isolationism it's probably not going to work out for anybody moving forward. So the real battle in the future might be, how do we 
get ourselves on the same standard to make transactions seamless, but without sacrificing just what makes it interesting to travel, which is our cultural differences and our cultural heritage. So people talk about technology getting rid of jobs. They talk about a lot of sort of, you know, issues that technology has created. But the one thing I don't hear about is how technology, because of the, because of the need or the quest for a single standard beyond geographies, beyond local geographies. In other words, you want to use your Amex, not just in America, but in Canada and Mexico, in Europe and so on. The idea is that you've got this single standard that forces everyone to get on the same page, but at the same time rewards essentially the same players that backed that technology. So all of a sudden you've got these virtual monopolies, um, you know, like Amazon or whoever decides they can set the standard that is you know, either the most secure or the most seamless. At that point, you've got a smaller and smaller number of players, and then those people will, will be tied into, you know, another, again, and they're the same sets of players, like the real estate tycoons. And, and the question again becomes, how do you balance that with just being able to walk into a store in, in the capital city of, of Kazakhstan and being able to, you know, get something that's local um, it may be, you know, right now you go in here, the things are priced, you know, the same as they would be in the EU or in, in, in New York City or in San Francisco. Um, so you've got this transfer of wealth that's, you know, sort of going back and forth between similar organizations. What's the solution? I don't know. Um, but I think we're going to have to figure it out fairly quickly unless we want all the capital cities in the world to look the same.